and AI to deliver science for the nation. And I've brought with me just a series of examples across NOAA's very broad mission areas of how these tools are used to deliver science that serves the nation. The lie that's in here is that there are really no good, in my opinion, no good AI examples. So what you're going to see is machine learning and robotics. But Raj was begging me for my abstract because I was late. And so I, I fibbed so that he would still want me to come here and, and talk with you. <laughs> Has anyone here ever been late and oversold what they thought they were going to deliver? <laughs> so NOAA is an agency of the U.S. federal government. Our job is to enrich life through science. Our mission area stretches from the surfaces of the sun, through the atmosphere, to the land, the surface of the ocean, and into the deep ocean. And our overarching mission through all that space is to keep the public informed of the changing environment around us. And you see these products through daily weather forecasts, severe storm warnings, uh, climate monitoring, fisheries management, coastal resilience, supporting marine commerce, and a whole range of services that protect human health and protect economic vitality in the US. And so I'm going to start with the sun and start with an example here and then travel down through uh, vertically back into the atmosphere to the land surface the ocean surface into into the deep ocean and share just non-technical this is this is cocktail party level discussion of some use cases that we have in this field so one of the many things that NOAA does is actually monitor and simulate space weather, which is, are the geomagnetic, geomagnetic changes uh, from the sun. And we're familiar with the concept of coronal mass ejections, these volatile ejections of geomagnetic pulse that come out from the surface of the sun and, and travel through space. And if they're traveling in the right direction, they're going to intersect with uh, the ionosphere and, and the, the planet that we live on. And so NOAA does a lot of, we have specialized satellites that measure what we call the solar wind. And then we have ground sensors to actually detect uh, what changes in, in geomagnetic potential are happening on the ground. But what happens in between needs to be modeled. And so NOAA performs uh, geomagneto uh, modeling to figure out what happens from what we sense with the solar wind to what happens on the ground and actually issue warnings uh, of probability of exceedance for uh, different thresholds, uh, particularly relevant to the U.S. power grid. Who knows Faraday's law? Everybody? This one. So changing magnetic field in a functioning closed circuit will induce an electromotive force. So this is bad for our, our electrical grid if these changes are so severe or happening rapidly. So this is a, an important thing to keep track of both for our uh, electric grid, but also for satellites and a, a lot of other sensitive electronics. So here's a great sort of dark science-y picture, right? All the pictures of science are us in the darkness or in the white lab coats. This is a good one. Uh, and you can see some of the, the scanners and, and models they have up here. This is a screenshot of actually a time-varying model output the warmer colors, of course, are this is the northern hemisphere focused on North America. And you can go on NOAA's website, the Space Weather website, and actually see videos of that uh, warm color map changing. And these are forecasts of changes in geomagnetic potential. And that is communicated out to a whole suite of users that we talk to. So the use case here. So we have observations of the solar wind. We have probability of exceedance and warnings on the ground. This is a nonlinear process. We have measured it for decades, but of course our modeling of it is incomplete. And so with advances uh, in machine learning through image recognition and speech recognition, we are using decades worth of data of sensed exceedance thresholds on the ground and what was the forcing coming from the solar winds and combining uh, neural network algorithms to help make sure that we are modeling correctly, but also then uh, refining the accuracy of those results using those neural network outputs. And so uh, because thresholds are important, 
this is a decision tree matrix on the left, which is a particularly useful al algorithm uh, for, for threshold and exceedance. On the right is a total skill score. This is a classic modeling plot, right? It used to be okay and now it's better because we did something different. Uh, and the idea is that uh, our skill score in this case, both accurate positive detections of threshold exceedance as well as absence of false positives are ranked uh, by the scientists and the network is trained in that regard to make sure it's performing in both ways. We're leaving the sun. We're still in a, a mid-Earth uh, uh, orbit here. And this is one of our uh, environmental sensing satellites that we have. There are a whole range of environmental sensing problems that NOAA designs satellites. So we design them in concert with NASA and then, and then sense the Earth from space. So, of relevance on, on this particular satellite is visible infrared imaging radiometer. And this is, this is used together with synthetic aperture radar together to uh, remote sense both in the visible and non-visible spectrums. A whole range of environmental uh, factors. Those could be snow and ice cover, sea surface temperature, cloud cover, cloud thickness, ocean color, uh, winds at the, at the north and south pole, all sorts of Items. The use case I want to talk about is actually around oil spill detection. This is an image from the Deepwater Horizon leak in the Gulf. Uh, the thing that doesn't look like beautiful, clean water is oil. And so for a massive event like Deepwater Horizon, there, there's not a question that there has been an event, but there has been a leakage event. But there is a question about its severity, how it is tracking over time the ability of our ocean models to actually help predict where it's going to go and how it might disperse. And then separate from that, there are over a, a thousand annual cases in the U.S. economic zone, in the waters off the U.S. alone, where we have smaller leakages, either of oil or illicit discharge from commercial vessels. And we cannot have a staff of people that are just scanning uh, imagery all the time to try to detect these. And so one of the features that we've used machine learning for is uh, texture classification. So this is uh, remote sensing from that satellite and trying to classify differences in sea surface texture uh, based on the returns back to the satellite. And so through this, what we have is an algorithm that can help detect anomalies in sea surface texture and then trying to train that beyond just a detection of yes or no, but actually uh, improving its skill at uh, making clear which ones might be oil spills or illicit discharge based on specific textural and uh, spectral characteristics of that sensing. And so this is the birds that, I'm gonna go on the right screen. This purple part is the land, or the lighter purple. Uh -huh. This is the land, this is the southern terminus of the Mississippi Delta. And what we have, in the center, this is tagged as an oil spill, actually from a known uh, sunken vessel that periodically, it's, it hasn't been removed and it periodically discharges oil. And what we have over on the right are similar detection, but not oil spill. You can see in the, in the visible range, there is a discoloration. This could be, uh, it could be seagrass, uh, it could also be dredged spoils from the navigation channel being tossed aside. And so, this is a good example this, uh, of the oil spill detection of a joint machine learning human uh, detection system. But we don't trust the algorithm enough to give consistent true positives. But what we do is allow it to scrub all of the ocean imagery that we have and flag uh, target areas that are worthy of human inspection. So we have a small group of two or three people that actually go after the fact and do manual detection and closer inspection on all of these alerts. And we have direct line into the U.S. Coast Guard if we think there is an unreported spill, or if, uh, if a vessel comes to port in the U.S. With a, with a bilge water fill of dirty water, they have to pay to pump that out and have it environmentally treated. So there's a strong economic incentive for them to dump that bilge water before they get to the coast. And so we have had instances where we have flagged 
uh, within a couple hours what we think is illicit discharge, and we hand that off to the Coast Guard, and they'll send a cutter out and inspect that vessel. Here's another map image of that. Uh, this showing a drift line. Uh, here's the leakage spot, uh, spot, and then the drift line of the of the contaminant. Uh, and this is oil in this case again. So now we're going to talk about land surface and sea surface. And just this image itself, it's not robotics per se, but to talk about technological advance, this is a real color uh, geographic satellite image from a satellite co-designed and, and managed again, designed and uh, launched with NASA and then handed over to NOAA for execution. This image was not possible four years ago. We, didn't have the possibility of having high definition, real color imagery uh, from satellites uh, as recently as four years ago. And so we are still seeing a lot of advances in just basic quality of remote sensing like that. When folks think about NOAA, aside from the deep sea exploration, the most common uh, connection folks have with NOAA is with the National Weather Service and the modeling and the alerts for regular and severe weather that are impacted. And so there are incredible amounts of resources spent at NOAA on the broad problem of numerical weather prediction, which is how do we measure all of the inputs and then the physical and chemical changes in the atmosphere to predict changing weather. <coughs> this is a schematic of how numerical weather prediction is discretized and made into a solvable problem. So I hope you can see that our planet is here. <laughs> and then there is a vert there is a uh, lat long grid is spread around the Earth, and then there are also vertical depths to that. So each node in here is a computation node in a, essentially a chemical fluid dynamics model. We're solving the Navier-Stokes equation, and we're solving uh, chemical and heat exchange within each grid point, with each e within each time step, and over a whole host of variables that are listed at the bottom. And we do this every six hours for the country, and more frequently when there are storms. And we have special systems when there's a hurricane or a tornado system. There are actually special sub-modeling teams that just model those severe weather-specific events. This is what we're talking about. It's just everyday weather. So you could imagine this is a very computationally expensive calculation. And there are kind of two parts to it very roughly. The first part are all the physical parameters and the solution from node to node, from time step to time step, of how all the physical parameters are changing. And then separately, this is not a closed system. The Earth radiates heat out, and it receives radiation in from the sun. And so there's a constant uh, radiation forcing that's going on through the model. And those two phases, that what I think of as just the physical fluid dynamics solution and then the radiation solution, they both cost about half of the computational expense of producing an accurate numerical weather prediction. And so one of the areas that we have been able to make improvements, oops, that doesn't make sense yet, is through the radiation forcing, again, deeply nonlinear and difficult to solve, at least for the fluid dynamics we have Navier-Stokes, you can estimate turbulence closure and some of the smaller processes that can't be modeled within the grid, and you can get pretty good. The radiation modeling is even more difficult. And so there, are, uh, there have been advances in the past few years of training neural networks. Again, NOAA is lucky that we have reams and reams of sensed data and real outputs on the ground, and then we have reams and reams of the model runs and the inputs that were used to try to predict those outputs. And so we've been training neural networks to actually map and simulate the radiative forcing rather than having to solve it by brute force uh, strictly through the solution grid. And so this is a, a typical difference plot where up on the top, I actually don't even know which is which, but one on the left is the pure brute force solution where both the radiation and the uh, fluid dynamics are solved within the mesh. And then on the right side is the fluid dynamics solved on the mesh and the radiative solution provided through the neural network training. And then on the bottom are difference plots where white colors show small differences. So you can see we're having, uh, we still need to make improvements around the equator, but in the uh, outside of the tropics and at the poles, we are doing, uh, we are doing well. 
This has resulted in a, depending on cloud cover and the complexity of the weather on that day, uh, the low end of improvement has been 16x improvement on uh, wall clock time uh, for the simulation and upwards of 50 or 60 uh, if it's a more simple weather day. So folks are excited about that. We're going to move to the surface of the Earth real quickly. NOAA creates and maintains what is called the National Spatial Reference System. So we know there's a, a constellation of global navigation uh, GPS satellites up in space. So you open Google Maps on your phone and you get a blue dot to show you where you are on the Earth. When your phone in that sensor is talking to the satellites, what they are actually talking about together are where are you in relation to the satellites. They don't yet know how to connect you with actually where you are on the ground on the surface of the Earth. We need a model for that. That is the uh, National Spatial Reference System. And within that, of course, there are many things on the surface of the Earth that aren't a GPS antenna or looking at their own GPS information where we need to know where we are in, re in relation to this building, that parking lot, uh, or the center line of a highway, or a whole bunch of use cases. All of those things need to be tied into the same spatial reference frame and same vertical reference frame to make sense of all the measurements and tracking of where they fit relative to each other. And that is made possible by the National Spatial Reference System. One of the important services that NOAA provides, free of cost, aside from taxpayer dollars, to the commercial enterprise, regardless of who you are, if you're a researcher, if you're a Trimble GPS, if you're Fugro who do global scale remote sensing, if you have a, GPS, a piece of GPS hardware and it has an antenna on it, that antenna needs to be calibrated so that you can know exactly when it senses where it thinks it is on the surface of the Earth, that that is accurately tied in to the rest of this system. So you think about an antenna for GPS, it's usually the white uh, UFO looking things. If you've seen those. So it has a geometric center, but where is its actual electropotential center? When it is talking to the satellites and saying, here I am, well, where is that exactly? Is it on the rim? Is it in the geometric center? Does that change as that sensor is tipped and moving through space? So this would be influenced by if you tip it one way and it's talking to a satellite and suddenly that signal is going through more of your hardware or less of your hardware or some current, a little microcurrent inside of your thing, its measurement of where it thinks it is changes slightly. And so we provide a service of calibrating these antennas against uh, known parameters so that you can correct those very small biases and make sure that when you're purporting to give millimeter and submillimeter accuracy that you actually are doing so. Up until five years ago, we used to do this by having two poles in the ground that were surveyed in. There'd be the real antenna that we knew was surveyed and we believed that was truth. We put that on top of the one pole and we put your new sensor on the other and measure how they recorded and then we trade them and you could do a calibration based on that, which is good but not great. This image here is a custom built robot where you can see this disc, it's kind of like a mounting cylinder. You attach the GPS receiver here, and this robot goes through a series, uh, all through six degrees of freedom, and it rotates and accelerates this antenna through a whole series. And because we know exactly what the robot is doing and where it is, we can then calibrate the, the sensor's recordings and what, where it thought it was and correct that and calibrate it that way. So there's a, there's a quick video of this, just going through some of its motions. Uh, this video doesn't show it, but the robot will, will tip it upside down, it will translate it. But what it is doing is taking every antenna now through the same exact series of motions so that they can be calibrated and that their measurements are, are corrected uh, versus that global positioning framework that I mentioned. Happening alongside this, so this robot's in that little protective clamshell and all that. Of course, the Earth that it's sitting on is also moving. 
And so we track that as well, and we can correct the calibration uh, for, for the, the tectonic movement that happens over time. So this, I, many of you, anyone working in robots, right? it's not always the Terminator with lasers shooting out of the eyes doing stuff. This is a major advantage uh, for us, for the entire commercial uh, geospatial industry, to improve accuracy and timeliness. It doesn't look like much, but it's a, a really important step forward. Who knows what the heck this is? We're now on the surface of the ocean, that's it. <laughs> The Gulf Stream. So the colors are uh, sea surface temperature. That tan orange polygon on the left, that's North America. And you can see this uh, dense current coming up the east coast. This is east coast of Florida. And then spreading out once it gets, these are the Carolinas, and heading east. And you see all these eddies that are shed across. So beautiful example of fluid dynamics writ large across the Atlantic Ocean. There are a number of ocean observing systems where we are using robotics to improve our understanding of these systems and predict, uh, ability to predict through modeling uh, what is happening. One of the key uh, use cases for us is modeling hurricane genesis, uh, transit through the ocean, and particularly how quickly it will intensify or, or weaken. This was a big deal in Hurricane Michael in 2018 that hit the panhandle of Florida. That went from a Category 2 to a Category 5 hurricane within in less than 24 hours. And we didn't model, we got the track right, we got the landfall right, we didn't model the intensity, uh, the intensification that rapidly. And one of the main inputs to hurricane intensity is ocean heat content. And so one of the ways we look at ocean heat content is using, uh, this is a, an ocean glider. So you can see it's probably its back third is sticking through the surface here. You can see its telemetry and a solar panel on its tail. And it has a whole instrument package on its nose where it can measure all sorts of uh, ocean chemistry. But in this case, we're going to focus on sea surface temperature. So here's a map. This is, again, the, the warm colors are the sea surface temperature. You can see it's warm in the Gulf of Mexico. It's warm all the way through the mid-Atlantic and then uh, gets cooler up into the Gulf of Maine and Cape Cod. So these are, this chart here is from satellite remote sensing of sea surface temperature, which is great. These little purple lines are the glider tracks that are out there, where they are, they are talking back to us, telling us where they are and what they're measuring. To look at this plot, you would think, well, everywhere here from North Carolina down is very warm. Right? That's what this tells you to varying degrees. What the gliders can tell us is actually how that heat is distributed vertically through the ocean, through the water column. So this from right to left is actually the transit of one glider. So it's, it's, it's bobbing up and down through the water column as it travels. And so its journey is from, from left to right here. And if you look at the surface up at the top of this plot, that is the sea surface temperature, the same thing we can get from satellites. But can you notice a big difference on the left half of this plot to the right half? In the left half, the ocean heat is highly stratified. Right? We have a very well-mixed warm section and then a sharp gradient into a cold section. Whereas later in its track, it was well-mixed all the way through the vertical. That is a type of information we can't get from remote sensing for the satellites, but we can get from uh, robotics that we put in the ocean. So there is now an effort underway between NOAA, academia, and the US Navy, where we see an active storm system. We have to coordinate who's got what gliders where, put them all in the water, and actually set up what we call a picket line across lines of most likely transit for uh, hurricane development. So that as the hurricane is tracking into that space, we can get this vertical uh, picture of what's going on through the water column. The last piece here, uh, deep ocean exploration. Uh, what's pictured here is a remote operating vehicle, and it's actually tethered to a manned submersible. So there's people in a little mini science submarine, and then this is their toy that they send out. And those scientists that are in that other submarine can drive this with like a joystick or Xbox controller. They also have live telepresence to scientists back on the mainland. 
one of the most scarce scientific resources on the planet is actually bunk time and science time on one of these research cruises. And so not all the interested parties can go out, but through telepresence we can get them to participate. Until very recently, this was the mode in which we would take physical samples off the, off the seafloor. So here's an urchin with a little mechanical claw. What are some use types where this type of claw might not be great to actually take up a sample? Squishy things. What else? Delicate things. What's that? Uh, like, delicate things. Squishy, delicate. One more variable. Salt. 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 Salt? No? Silt. Uh, yeah, tiny things, maybe. Yeah, I like that. You added a fourth. Thank you. The other one I'm thinking of is uh, speedy things. <laughs> things that are a little bit quicker are, are tough to pick up. And so one of the robotic challenges that we've recently been working on is a kind of new framework for uh, benth benthic means bottom of the ocean, for benthic sampling. And actually using that, that claw arm to act, have the ability to pick up a vacuum hose. And you can see there's a rosette of canisters. There's five of these that can take uh, water samples or uh, actual samples of stuff or critters. And then the sixth one is left clear to, after each sample, you rotate to the clear one and you blow out any silt and sediment that was collected in the hose from the last one. Uh, and so here is a little red critter whose life is about to change uh, as this uh, <laughs> vacuum cleaner comes over. I, I'm not a robot guy. I find it really interesting that the design solution was to use the same similar claw to actually manipulate a flexible hose rather than design a hose that you could drive directly. I don't know, it seems obvious, but I didn't, I thought that was interesting. So th there is what we capture on this day. This is called a squat lobster. It's adorable. Uh, that, just his, his body from the eyes to his back is probably two inches long. Little, little tiny critter. Those are the use cases very quickly, and I'm at the end of my time here. Just a couple thoughts, we zoom out kind of enterprise-wide across NOAA. NOAA is a science agency, but we are very deeply and more so a data agency. We do so much remote sensing and modeling that data management is a, a, a prime sort of organizational uh, challenge and mandate for the agency. The CDO, we have a chief data officer. I never had one of those when I was in industry, but it's a big deal to NOAA. And our chief data officer was just promoted to be the Department of Commerce's chief data officer. So government writ large is starting to understand that we need to be treating data uh, in different ways than just for use by our academic partners. The second line, 70,250. NOAA tracks roughly 70,000 open data sets across our whole mission which represent roughly 250 terabytes of data. And it's kind of all over the map. It's, it's in the programs. About 40 of that 250 are the sort of uh, foundational measurements, data sets where we have been measuring different Earth characteristics for over a century in some cases. These are uh, issues of global and national significance to curate those data and make sure they're publicly available. We are talking a lot about creating our data and serving it in cloud-native formats so that it can be more easily ingested and used for training. The neural network and machine learning examples I had are really custom. They're typical of solution sets that are available to NOAA because of decades of quality sensing data, decades of modeling data, and decades of actually what happened on the ground data. And those are the pieces that are needed, of course, to train machine learning. We have just a whole bunch of that information and trying to, to learn how to use it and make it more available to the public is a priority for the agency. That website references NOAA's Big Data Project, which is a partnership with a commercial cloud enterprise. So this would be Microsoft, Azure, uh, Amazon Web, Google Cloud, uh, the heavy hitters where they are offering for free to host our data. And if you are a researcher that want to use that data, you can work and get sort of custom access through experts from NOAA to get the data you're interested served up. And of course, they do it for free for us because they hope if you are doing your computations and, and calculation, you'll, you'll buy their core compute hours and do it natively in the cloud, or you'll pay for egress to bring it down to your computer either way they win. 
Yeah, but that's an important uh, public-private partnership to get our data out beyond where it can be. Convergence, this is the National Academy's language currently for what used to be called multidisciplinary studies. The idea that in order to advance, particularly against complex social problems, we have to have multidisciplinary uh, work together. We have that same challenge at NOAA and within the government. We want an oceanographer, a satellite engineer, uh, a mechanical engineer, and we also want, we would love if that person had some data science background and, and could merge those two sciences together. There's a huge sort of uh, com competition for brains out there, for young, exciting brains to come work all across private industry, academia, and at government. So it's a really interesting strategic problem of how do we attract and retain top talent. And then the last piece is do good. I was really pleased to receive the invitation from Raj on this. Uh, we think a lot about how we make change in society and how our data can help better the human condition uh, across the planet. And for me, that invites a really interesting reflection on the idea that science itself is not a populist endeavor, meaning that all, not all opinions are equal. There are such things as, as objective truths. And training hard to master those truths and the techniques to reveal those truths are valuable. You don't just get a seat at the table because you want one and you care about the question. You have to have game to bring to it. And yet, at the same time, if we are seeking to use that science and information to change people's minds and change people's behaviors, it's common that we as technological folks spend time with this information and it becomes for us knowledge. It means something, not just in a technical sense, but versus our own values and our own vision for society. And if we seek to use that knowledge and change behavior, it is really important that for that last part about what are the values, what is good to the society, we must invite in non-experts to that discussion. Uh, there's a whole phrase and whole study of learning around co-production of knowledge. This is a really important part. If you are the super tech brain that just wants to invent the next tech thing, that is amazing. I admire you and I am your champion and you maybe don't have to work in this space. If you are interested in not just advancing technology but advancing human wellness and society as a whole, you must either yourself become comfortable with this concept of how do I bring in the voices of the people I seek to serve. Either you need to get good at that, or you need to make friends with people who are naturally good at it. And so that is my close. That's a challenge we wrestle with every day across the federal science uh, sphere. It's not easy. I'm really happy to be in the trenches with you all uh, tackling those problems. So thank you very much. We'll take a few questions. No. Alabama questions. <laughs> Some of you got that. Okay. Uh, yeah. The one behind. Uh, just following up on the last thing that you said, which I think is um, really amazing. What are some ways that NOAA is doing that? There are parts of NOAA whose mission, so any federal agency, it does what it does, not because it's cool or because the humans there want to. They do it because Congress or the president at some time in the past have told them they must do it. Some of those must-dos, many of them, are very science-based. You must deliver X, must deliver weather forecasts. You must create nautical charts for the marine commerce. There are other parts of NOAA whose mandates in the language are actually about helping people. Uh, along the U.S. coastline is a good example. Our mandate is to help coastal communities understand and react to changes that they are faced with. And it's up to us to figure out how to do it. Those parts of NOAA who have that as their mission and have been at this co-production of knowledge, they have learned those lessons the hard way over the past decades and are now being leaned on by other parts of NOAA who are either asked or the humans that work there are waking up to the fact that I can't just produce a technical plot or even a warning saying, hey, a flash flood coming, here you go, my part's done. Well, if there are still people that get killed in that, that's a problem for us. And so we are doing it by, uh, I think, leaning on, celebrating that expertise where it exists within NOAA, and then uh, also uh, kind of going out into academia and practicing best practice. 
Real quick to answer your question specifically, what that looks like in practice is what we call high touch engagement, which means person to person. If you're a coastal manager and I'm in your region, you are actually going to know me. I'm going to come to those community meetings at night. I'm going to talk to you over beers about what was hard. I'm going to share lessons that I'm hearing from the rest of the country. It is very personal. It is a grind. It takes years and years to build that capacity and that trust. And that's one of the challenges that we face. Well, that's hard to scale up. And it's a different talent set than the technical uh, scientists and people that we usually hire. Thanks. Hi. Hi. I was curious about the underwater telepresence robot. So what kind of communication do you use to, uh, communication medium do you use to do a telepresence with the people on surface? Yeah, uh, I, I so, probably don't know in the detail. I know to, at least that little remote guy, that is, that's tethered cabling. So that, that's straight electromechanical connection yeah. to, the, to the thing. I, I, I think that human submersible is actually also tethered to the boat at the surface and then you've got satellite telemetry and you're off to go. I don't think we are remote telemetry through the water column. Because that, I mean, we, we can be two miles below the surface sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Last question. Uh, if you're into the remote stuff, every research cruise by NOAA is live broadcast. Like you can watch CNN and watch all the boring debate, or you can watch NOAA, which is also kind of boring, right? Until they come up, it's like just this blank muck on the ground. But uh, you can see all of that. You can often hear the chatter between the scientists and the deck officers that are running the ship. So it's kind of cool. Um, so you showed the um, deep sea exploration, but I was wondering, do you guys also do inland uh, rivers and streams and stuff, looking at the health of the river, like the Amazon or the Mississippi under the water, anything like that? Yes, and other folks do as well. NOAA's purview in, so that would be riparian waters, the freshwater uh, open channel streams and rivers. We have authority in that space with respect to fish habitat and uh, health of, of commercial fisheries that depend on the rivers and live in the rivers. Even if they never hit the ocean, NOAA, that's <coughs> NOAA's only pure freshwater mission. We also work in close partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey, which is in the Department of Interior, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, all of whom have kind of different swim lanes in that space. So they would be the ones, together with the Environmental Protection Agency, that might be measuring water chemistry and uh, chemical health, as well as health of other non-fishery stuff in those watersheds. Okay, I think we'll end there. Uh, let's thank Mark for his excellent talk. Thank you.